Now some men from Zeph came to Saul at Giba to tell him, David is hiding on the hill of Akela, which overlooks Yishimon. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's elite troops and went to hunt him down in the wilderness of Zeph. Saul camped along the roads beside the hill of Akela near Yishimon, where David was hiding. When David learned that Saul had come after him in the wilderness, he sent out spies to verify of Saul's arrival. David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of his army, were asleep inside a ring formed by slumbering warriors. Who will volunteer to go there with me? David asked Achimelech the Hittite and Abishai, son of Zeruah, Yohab's brother. I'll go with you, Abishai replied. So David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. God has surely handed your enemy over to you this time, Abishai whispered to David. Let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't need to strike twice. No, David said, don't kill him, for who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed? Surely the Lord will strike Saul dead down someday, or he will die of old age or in battle. The Lord forbid that I should kill the one who has been anointed. Take his spear and that jug of water beside his head, and then let's get out of here. So David took the spear and the jug of water that were near Saul's head. Then he and Abishai got away without anyone seeing him or even waking up, because the Lord had put Saul's men into a deep sleep. David climbed the hill opposite the camp until he was at a safe distance. And then he shouted down to the soldiers and to Abner, son of Ner, Wake up, Abner! Abner said, Who is it? Well, Abner, you're a great man, aren't you? David taunted. Where in all Israel is there anyone as mighty? So why haven't you guarded the master king when someone came to kill him? This isn't good at all. I swear by the Lord that you and your men deserve to die because you failed to protect the master, the Lord's anointed. Look around, where is the king's spear and the jug of water that were beside his head? Saul recognized David's voice and called out, is that you, my son, David? And David replied, Yes, my lord, the king. Why are you chasing me? What have I done? What is my crime? But now let the lord king listen to his servant. If the lord has stirred you up against me, then let him accept my offering. But if this is simply a human scheme, then for those involved, be cursed by the lord. For they have driven me from my home so that I can no longer live among the lord's people. And they had said, go worship pagan gods. Must I die on foreign soil, far from the presence of the Lord? Why has the king of Israel come out to search for a single flea? Why does he hunt me down like a partridge in the mountains? Then Saul confessed, I have sinned. Come back home, my son. I will no longer try to harm you. You valued my life today. I have been a fool and very, very wrong. Hi everyone, we want to invite you to a time of worship. Would you sing along with us as we sing some songs? First one is Build My Life. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one.
You have been so, so kind to me And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down and fights till I'm found Leaves the 99 earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away, oh the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of oh God, Love.
Hey, welcome back to our uh, summer series as we discover some, some really great Old Testament stories. Uh, today, we're going to look at uh, Saul and David. Uh, back in May, when we uh, sat down to kind of think through the summer series and what it would look like and what would be great stories, of course, there's more than nine stories that we could have told. Um, but one of them that uh, we wanted to talk about was Saul and David because of the relationship that they had, but also how David handled uh, a really rough time. Uh, somebody was actually trying to kill him. So we're gonna look at Saul and David today. I would say it is a beautiful story of grace and respect and loving our enemies in a way that maybe baffles our enemies. It baffles those who maybe would be opposed to us. And, and so, first of all, we have to kind of look at the history. Uh, king Saul was the very first king of Israel. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Bible says he was head and shoulders above the others, meaning he was, he was a tall guy, he was a big guy. And he was born around 1076 BC in the land of Benjamin in Israel. And being the first king, somewhere around 30 years of age, that would be 1046 B.C., and he united the tribes of Israel together as one nation. And they defeated the enemies that uh, were always trying to attack them, the Ammonites, the, the uh, Philistines, the Moabites, uh, the Amalekites. Uh, it was, um, they were pretty well surrounded. And so after Saul... Uh, publicly disobeyed God. It, this was a big deal. Uh, he disobeyed God in such a way that the whole nation saw him disobey, and he tried to justify his disobedience. And so um, he was told then that he was going to, uh, his family was going to be replaced, that the kingly line ended with him. And so uh, Samuel, uh, we heard Trevor talk about Samuel as a child. Samuel, who was the prophet or the preacher of Israel, anointed David as a young man who would be his replacement. This would be somewhere around 1020 uh, BC. And so it became a, a time of, of Saul being very jealous of being pushed aside by God. And, and then there were these accolades that were bestowed upon David um, because he did something really amazing. He killed a giant named Goliath. And, and so um, Saul made several failed attempts to take David's life because he was so jealous of David and his popularity with people. So David, as a young man, uh, he ran for his life. And over time, he accumulated 600 other uh, people in similar circumstance, they became a small army, their families all traveled together. Uh, they, they were really a, a Bedouin uh, band of people on the move. And on two occasions, Saul uh, could have been killed by David. Um, and we're going to look at the second one today. Um, you, you heard about that as the scripture was being read earlier today. And so the question is, what can we learn from it? Now, for one thing, uh, in, in this broken world, we don't have to go around looking for trouble. Many times, uh, trouble will come looking for us, uh, as in David's case. Uh, we read this terrible story and we say, wow, what is it that David did that would just, Saul would just feel like he had to kill him to get rid of him? And going back to that story of uh, as a young man without any armor, he, he goes toward Goliath, uses a slingshot, and kills him. Uh, it's a true story. In fact, all of the stories we're talking about this summer are true stories. They actually happened. And so um, 
what made the king mad enough to get 3,000 elite troops to go after David and his, his army of 600? And, and here's what it is. All the people began singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Ruh, roh, roh, that, that did it. That did it. The, the ego of Saul could not handle somebody uh, besting him. And so David began playing Willie Nelson's on the road again and fled, ran for his life, place to place, out in the high desert, running for his life. So here's the question. Have you ever had trouble looking for you at school? Have you had somebody that you haven't done anything to them? They just, they just pick on you. They're, they're looking for you. They're trying to get you to take the bait and have a fight with them. Or maybe at work. Maybe you've got somebody who's jealous of your relationship with the boss or the good work that you do. Uh, maybe in the neighborhood. They, you just have neighbors who are just, they're just cranky. They just... Um, they, they, don't, they don't want to have anything to do with you. They're always harping on you about something. Maybe somebody in your family. Maybe you, you're not trying to, but maybe, maybe you have uh, uh, siblings or maybe you've got cousins or, or whatever it might be in your family. What, what might it be? We find ourselves not knowing what to do so often, Right? not knowing how to respond, and we find ourselves maybe frustrated or we find ourselves maybe a little scared. David knew how you feel this morning. Perhaps trouble um, has come your way and you're tempted to fight back. Maybe you're tempted to lash out on social media. Maybe you're tempted to lash out verbally. Uh, maybe you're tempted to, to uh, just, just have a meltdown with people. Maybe you're tempted to do that. Saul was responding in a mean, vindictive, and destructive way. And David wanted to talk to him in the worst way, mano y mano, and, and to his face. And Saul wanted to nail his hide to the wall. Now, there's, there's, that's a lot of room to try and find to find common ground. And that's how it was between David and Saul. So David was forced to run. And David... He had to protect his family. And so they were, went out into the high desert wilderness area, and that was his home for several years, on the run. Temporary place, place to place. You know, you and I can't help when somebody does not want peace or, or they, don't, they don't want reconciliation or, or maybe they physically want to fight with you. You know, th those are things that we have no control over. But what... What we do have control over is how we respond as Jesus followers and how we respond uh, um, being able to speak peace and, and not, to be, not to be fighters. We believe, one of our Anabaptist values is we believe in the peace of Jesus and that everybody has value and, and that the peace of Jesus brings us to a place of wanting to make reconciliation with those around us uh, in Christ, those who are in our culture, in our lives. And so there are several things that we can learn from this chase by David, uh, by Saul after David. Number one, David refused to fight Saul. Now I want the boys and girls to really hear this today. David refused to fight Saul. Can you imagine what it took for this this soldier, this, this uh, warrior, David, to not fight King Saul. He, he refused to get down on the same level as Saul, uh, who was not even handling David in, in a godly way. Really, he was trying to handle him in a pagan way. And, and, and so uh, it's really important when trouble comes looking for us because sometimes um, we got to be careful because sometimes we try and help trouble out because we don't respond well. And, and so it's important when trouble comes our way, 
is that we respond the Jesus way. As Anabaptists, as followers of Jesus, we're called to this high bar of expectation that Jesus says, hey, there's another way to respond. We're not going to react the way the world does. Bless them that persecute you. Bless them that talk bad about you. Um, uh, live at peace. You know, love your enemies. These were the things that Jesus was teaching. In fact, Matthew 5, 44 uh, talks about, I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and that way you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. What an amazing passage. So just as God is, is not the, the God that is sitting there with a baseball bat ready to club us when we get out of line, uh, so David was trying to, to do what Jesus taught us a thousand years later. And he said in Matthew 5, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. So working for peace is messy, and it's misunderstood. And some places um, on the playground or in the work site, it's not even appreciated, right? Right? And it takes precious time. And, and it's opposite to what our culture tells us to do. Our culture says we should respond in kind. You know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And, um, and that is not what Jesus wants us to do. And David understood that a thousand years, I mean 500 years before Jesus was even on the earth. So David's culture was to be the last guy standing. That's what he comes out of. Instead, he refused to take the bait, and he refused to respond in kind. And so um, Jesus speaks to this in my, Matthew chapter 5. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you're my followers. Be happy about it. Wow. Be happy about it. How could David be happy that Saul was chasing him? How can you and I be happy when somebody at work is, is uh, doing things to, to, to try and jeopardize our job or, or uh, neighbors in the neighborhood who, who are judging and, and uh, just making it difficult? What do you do about that? Be happy about it, Jesus said. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. And so what Jesus is saying to us and what David was trying to live in front of us is not to be drawn into the vortex of drama wherever you live and, and work and, and play. At school, don't take the bait. Don't go for the fight. Within the family... Um, you don't have to have the last word. You don't have to win the argument. You, you don't have to do that. See, David refused to fight. There's a second thing. David refused vengeance, but was proactive for peace. Let's go back to chapter 26 there in uh, 1 Samuel. And um, go down to verse 5. David slipped over to Saul's camp one night to look around. Saul and Abner's son, um, I'm sorry, Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of his army, were sleeping inside a ring formed by the slumbering warriors. David speaking here. Who will volunteer to go there with me? David asked Abimelech the Hittite and Abishai the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother. I'll go with you, Abishai replied. So David and Abishai went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep. With his spear stuck in the ground beside his head, Abner and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. Now, one could make the argument David sought peace because he and his army were outmanned six to one. Yet I would remind us this morning that David defended Israel all by himself, fighting Goliath the giant, greatly outmanned by a guy who was anywhere from 9 to 11 feet tall, had 300 pounds of armor on, and a lot of experience. Saul was someone he knew. 
and, and he loved Saul and he respected Saul. And David was, was very proactive in going to Saul for peace. And by the way, more than once, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, David surprised Saul and, and tried to talk to him and he urged Saul to, to, do the, to do the same. Let's talk and not listen to others. Uh, let's, let's sit down and, and be able to have conversation. And we see this in chapter 24. Look at verse 9 as David shouts at Saul. Why do you listen to the people who say I'm trying to harm you? This very day, you can see with your own eyes it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I'll never harm the king. He's the Lord's anointed. Saul did not listen to David in that story, in that chapter, and he kept coming after David. I will say to you, God calls us to be a David today, a person who, who seeks to make peace as Jesus called us to. And I, I want to encourage you, don't listen to others without going to the source, at wherever you might be, whether it's at work, whether it's in your family or the neighborhood, even here at church, Go to the source, wherever the trouble's coming from. Remember this, don't let others tell you what God wants you to do when it contradicts God's character. That's what was happening with David. Kill him, kill him, let him have it. He's right in your presence. Man, take the spear. In fact, I'll do it for you. I'll take the spear and it won't take two times. I'll do it. In chapter 24 and in chapter 26, that's exactly what was whispered to him. Take him. God's put him into your hands. Kill him. But you know, it's interesting. I think David understood exactly what God had done and that this was not God's character to put his enemy in front of him and for him to uh, exploit him that way and take his life. Now, David was not a perfect guy, as we well know, right? Uh, none of us are. But I, I got to tell you, David knew God's heart, and I think he really wanted to do right by Saul. There, there's, a third, there's a third point here. David treated Saul with grace and dignity. Um, how did he show that? Uh, okay, one or two ways here. First of all, he didn't hurt Saul at his most vulnerable time. Now, this is, uh, this is kind of interesting, um, just so you'll understand the backstory of what's going on here. In chapter 24, King Saul was, was after David. He and his army were assembled. They were trying to track him. And so Dave, uh, King Saul steps into a cave, well, to go to the bathroom uh, to relieve himself. And David was further back in the cave, and Saul didn't know it, and I, I don't think David knew it at first. And, um, and so he had a, an opportunity at Saul's most vulnerable, I might add, that he could have taken him. Um, and then there's another time in chapter 26 where Saul was asleep, like we read a minute ago. Uh, who is no more vulnerable? I mean, all of us, there's no more vulnerable time than when we're asleep and not aware of what's going on around us. I would say if we find ourselves wanting to avenge or teach a lesson to somebody when doing so, will embarrass them or humiliate them or hurt their reputation, we're no better than this broken world we live in if that's how we carry ourselves and conduct it's never an option. For a follower of Christ, it's never, ever, ever an option. So what did, Saul, what did David do? David put Saul in God's hands. You got a family member that's driving you nuts? Do you, do you have a neighbor who is just mean-spirited? Do you, do you have somebody at work or at school on the playground? Do you have somebody that they just, uh, they're just mean-spirited? I love what David said about Saul in, in 1 Samuel 26 and verse 10. Here's what he said. I'm not going to kill him. 
And he says, surely the Lord will strike Saul down someday. Or he'll die of old age or in battle. In other words, David was saying, I, I don't have to be around for this. I, I fully trust that God can handle that, the trouble that comes looking for me, the person of Saul. I believe God can take care of Saul far better than I can. Isn't that an amazing moment? Because David treated Saul with grace and dignity. Uh, you know, the Lord will always help you and me to do the right thing if we'll take the steps to do the right thing. Um, in chapter 26 there in verse 12, Saul's asleep. So David took the spear and jug of water in verse 12 that were near Saul's head. And then he and Abishai got away without anyone seeing them or even waking up because the Lord had put Saul, Saul's men into a deep sleep. And then you go down to verse 17. David calls out to Saul once he was where he was safe. And Saul recognized David's voice and calls out, Is that you, my son, David? And David replied, Yes, my lord, the king. Why are you chasing me? What have I done? What is my crime? But now let my lord, the king, listen to his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, then let him accept my offering. But if this is simply a human scheme, then may those involved be cursed by the Lord, for they have driven me from my home so I can no longer live among the Lord's people. And they've said, go worship pagan gods. And must I die on foreign soil far from the presence of the Lord? Why has the king of Israel come out to search for a single flea? Why does he hunt me down like a partridge on the mountains? And Saul confesses here, I have sinned. Come back home. I have sinned. Come back home, my son. I will no longer try to harm you, for you valued my life today. I've been a fool and very, very wrong. And so David says, here's your spear, O king. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal. And I refuse to kill you, for you, even when the Lord placed you in my power, you are the Lord's anointed one. Now may the Lord value my life, even as I have valued yours. And may he rescue me from all my troubles. Finally, man to man, <laughs> person to person, eyeball to eyeball. And Saul reacted appropriately between two people. And Saul was a recipient of grace with dignity. When I was a little boy, my dad was, uh, came to know Christ as his Savior uh, at 28 years of age. My dad was a rough guy. Uh, he grew up on the oil fields of Texas, the gas towns, the oil towns. And um, my dad was an alcoholic. Uh, my dad made uh, quite a bit of money. And um, he and my mom uh, just weren't getting along, in fact, um, I'd say very close to breaking up when one night a pastor knocked on the door, <laughs> a timely word, and, uh, uh, and shared the gospel with my dad. And my dad uh, uh, became a follower of Christ. It's interesting, my dad really grew in the Lord. And, uh, and maybe whether he should or shouldn't have, within a couple of years, he was pastoring a church as a new believer. But he was pastoring a church in a storefront. I, I was just a little, little kid. And my, my dad had a guy in the church who just uh, w was giving him a hard time and, and just uh, opposed him and said, said mean things about him to others and, and just, just really it was just being very difficult. And, and I don't think my dad responded well. I think my dad 
responded with that kind of a street fight mentality that, that he'd grown up with, you know, to the point where this young pastor who was being bothered by this man in the church, one night dad was just fuming about it and he decided he was going to go over and punch the guy out right there on his doorstep, right at his house. My dad got on car, got in the car, it must have been like 11 o'clock at night, he, he zipped across town, he was accelerating and breaking hard, and he was just, uh, he was just mad, you know, and, and he pulled up into the driveway, and he was ready to get out, and he was ready to go pound on the guy's door, and when he came to the door, he was going to belt him in the mouth, and when he pulled up into the driveway, and he turned off the engine, and turned off the lights, it was quiet. Crickets. My dad said later, it was like the Lord whispered in his ear, Charlie, do you see that house? Are the lights on? No. Okay. Anybody stirring inside? My dad said no. You think that guy's asleep? Yeah. My dad said it was like the Lord said to him, Charlie, if that guy who has been mean and untruthful can sleep like a baby, then you should have no problem backing up this car, going back home, getting in bed, and leave it in my hands. Leave it in my hands. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I will tell you, you and I have been called to a higher calling. That God has called us to love, to extend grace, to give dignity. To not take advantage of somebody in a vulnerable situation or an embarrassing situation. But God's called us to love one another God has called us to be together. God has called us to treat one another the way Jesus has called us to treat each other in life. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not even saying it's fun. But I am saying it is what God wants us to do, and that's enough. And I want to encourage you, whatever the situation is at work, whatever the situation is at home, in your life, between spouses, kids with the parents, parents with the kids, neighbors at school, whatever it is. Can I encourage you to get on your knees today and ask God to give you grace and dignity for the person and to be able to sit down and to be able to, uh, and to, be able to seek the other person that's what Jesus' followers have been called to do for a couple of millennia now. And it works. And our story from this summer, we see a brave soldier facing another brave soldier and God working in a miraculous way. Saul never chased David ever, ever again. What is God saying to you today? And maybe you're here today and God is speaking to you. I pray that you'll listen. I pray God is speaking to you in your walk with him or maybe God is calling you to know him, to follow a Jesus that teaches these things. Oh, he's so worth it. And we'd be glad to help you know Jesus and to follow Christ. Hey, email me at pat at waynefleetvic.com and we'd be glad to help any way we can. I want you to know that this week is a very important week in our lives because God is going to bring people across our path that we can be the hands and the feet and the heart of Jesus too, whether it's within our own house or all around us. Step up to the plate, swing for the fences. So let's pray together as we uh, finish up the service this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for our church family. Love them so much. I pray your blessings upon them. 
that you're going to give us opportunity to be the hands and feet and heart and lips of Jesus this week. Lord, it's going to be uh, maybe at, uh, at work or with our, within our own home or, or maybe with somebody across the street. And Lord, wherever it is, I pray that, uh, that we would be cognizant of the fact that you're working through us and Lord, I pray that people would see Jesus in us this week. And may we treat people with grace and dignity. Lord, I pray that we would be able to offer ourselves uh, to people and that we could just uh, genuinely uh, love them and be able to um, just to be able to minister to them in your name. So thank you for the message. Thank you for the scripture and this powerful story. And Lord, I pray that you would use us this week to be able to live this out. In Jesus' name, amen.